Pentagon says a U.S. drone strike has killed an Iran-backed militia leader in Baghdad, who U.S. officials say was behind recent attacks on American forces in the region. Hello, I'm Ellison Barber in for Gotti Schwartz, and you're watching. Stay tuned now. This latest strike is part of a series of retaliatory attacks the U.S. promised were coming after a drone attack killed three American soldiers in Jordan last month. The Pentagon says the man killed tonight was the commander of the Iraqi militia group called Kataib Hezbollah and that he was taken out in a targeted attack. The Pentagon also says this Iraqi militia group was directly responsible for the attack that killed those American service members. Militia officials say that two of their commanders had been killed in the strike, while a spokesperson for Iraq security services said the attack violated Iraqi sovereignty. To some, it raises the question, is the U.S. signaling a real willingness here to expand their approach in this region? NBC News senior White House correspondent Gabe Gutierrez joins me now with more. Gabe, what are we learning about these latest strikes? Oh, hi there, Allison. Well, we're learning several things from a U.S. official. We're also we're learning that this strike was in the planning stages ever since the president directed the military to look at potential options after the death of those three service members at that attack in Jordan. We understand from that U.S. official that the president gave the order for this particular attack last week. And Allison, you'll remember that at the time, reporters asked the president, had he made his decision about how to respond to the death? of those three American service members. The president at the time said yes. As we understand it, this was uh, one of those strikes that he had planned. As for why it took several days, uh, the strike happened as soon as the opportunity presented itself, and the U.S. official says that Iraq was notified shortly after the strike. You see those uh, pictures from the scene right there. And, Allison, you'll remember uh, that during the initial strikes of this campaign uh, on Friday, uh, the U.S. did not notify Iraq beforehand, uh, uh, even though it said it did, had to walk back those statements. And the Iraqi government was ab upset uh, that uh, the U.S. carried out this strike. You just hear, see the reaction, the initial reaction from the Iraqi government tonight. But again, the U.S. says that this is part of the ongoing campaign after the death of those three American service members, else. Yeah, Gabe, when the White House uses terms like an ongoing campaign, do we have any sense of how long that sort of campaign can last? Well, the White House has said repeatedly that this will continue at a time and place of its choosing, essentially warning all of these proxy groups uh, around the region that, Amer that the U.S. reserves the right to respond. Now, um, as we understand it, this will continue at least for several more days and potentially weeks, Ellison. And, of course, this all comes not just after the death of those three American service members, uh, but also you'll have to remember, as you know, uh, that there have been multiple attacks, more than 160 attacks, to not just uh, U.S. forces in the region, but also commercial ships going throughout the Red Sea. There's also been several airstrikes over the past few days unrelated to this specific response to these retaliatory strikes to the deaths of the American service members. But on Saturday, for example, the U.S. went after several Houthi targets in Yemen. After that, Iranian proxy group has gone after commercial ships in the Red Sea, repeated warnings for the U.S. for them to stop. Elson? Gabe, what are White House officials telling you about their current strategy, particularly for the strikes in retaliation for the deaths of those three American service members? Well, uh, Elson, the Yeah, go ahead. No, the White House is walking a very fine line here, as you know, and from your reporting from, you know, from Israel, there is major, there are major concerns that uh, the Israel-Hamas war could spiral into a larger conflict around the region. Yet, um, last week, the president said that he does not seek a wider war, but that he does hold Iran responsible for supplying the weapons used in these attacks against Americans. Certainly, Iran denies that it has supplied those weapons. 
But as the U.S. tries to walk that fine line and calibrate its response, it says that this was a targeted response that did, did uh, kill in a, um, a commander of one of those Iranian proxy group groups uh, that you mentioned, uh, Kataib Hezbollah. Uh, the U.S. says that this was very specifically targeted to killing uh, that leader who the U.S. says was directly uh, involved in the attack that killed those three American service members. So all around, Ellison, again, a very fine line as the U.S. seeks to respond after the deaths of those Americans, but also not escalate this so much that it does spiral into, out of control into that wider war. Allison. All right, Gabe Gutierrez, senior NBC News White House correspondent. Thank you. The search is on for five Marines who were aboard a military helicopter when it crashed in Southern California late last night. Marine Corps officials say they were flying from Las Vegas to the San Diego area when their aircraft was reported overdue. Search and rescue crews found the helicopter this morning. It was located in a mountainous terrain near San Diego. What we don't know right now is why the helicopter went down in the first place. But it does come as California has been battered by historic storms all week, causing three days of relentless rain. Here's how one local official described the search area. We're in the area, a remote area of the Cleveland National Forest. Uh, we, it's rugged terrain out here. There's lots of rocks. Uh, there, there's truck trails that go through the area, but uh, in the mud and the snow, it can become treacherous to travel in that area. NBC News correspondent Dana Griffin has the latest. Tonight, the urgent search for five missing Marines, their helicopter disappearing overnight in a remote area of San Diego County during a routine training flight. Our crews are out in this rugged terrain. It's slippery, it's muddy out, uh, we have snow. Military officials confirming the missing helo was located this morning. Now, a rescue effort for the five on board. All were assigned to the 3rd Marine Aircraft Wing. They were flying a CH-53E Super Stallion helicopter like this one. In a statement, the Marines say the crew departed from Creech Air Force Base near Las Vegas Tuesday night, heading to Marine Corps Air Station Miramar in San Diego County. Super Stallion is primarily used for transporting heavy equipment. It was last detected around 11.30 p.m. Tuesday, according to CAL FIRE, 50 miles east of its destination. Once the aircraft was reported overdue, search and rescue teams were dispatched. They had to go on foot to search the area of the coordinates of the last known location of that helicopter. Overnight, conditions near the crash were a mix of rain and heavy snow. It's unclear if the severe weather was a factor in the crash. NBC's Dana Griffin, thank you. California is in recovery mode tonight after days of torrential rain because of the deadly storm sweeping across that state. At least four people were killed, and it sounds like officials fear an even higher death toll. The storm triggered flooding and mudslides in Southern California, while up north, people there dealt with fallen trees and down power lines from incredibly rough winds. Now, after four straight days of rain, officials are waiting for the water to recede to start assessing the full scope of damage, but not before another smaller storm brings a little more rain. NBC News meteorologist Bill Karens joins us now with the forecast. Bill, good evening. Oh, good evening, Ellison. And yes, another storm is rolling through California. This one is different than the last one. The last one stalled out. It was like two or three days. This one is flying. It's moving quickly. It does pack a punch when you see the bright yellows and red on the radar. You know, where it is raining, it's brief and it's heavy. And that's the concern as we go throughout the overnight hours as this moves into areas of Southern California that had just gotten the five to 10 inches of rainfall earlier this week and over the past weekend. You know, we've heard reports as many as 450 documented mudslides. A lot of hills are saturated. They're barely holding on. And they're afraid that this additional rainfall could cause some of it to, you know, you know, some of the hillsides to give way once again. So we should see additional mudslides and landslides uh, possible tonight and tomorrow. So here as we go through this evening, as the storm quickly moves through, I mean, you can see how fast it is. By the time we get to 8 a.m., this thing is almost all out of California and into Arizona and Utah. So this will be an overnight event for areas from L.A. to Oceanside to San Diego. By the time the sun comes up, this is over with. It is done with. So the difficult travel will shift during the day into Arizona and southern portions here of Utah. Uh, 
lot of heavy snow, especially on the rim here. Once you get outside of Phoenix, once you get outside of uh, Prescott and south of Flagstaff, that's the area that will have significant snow and difficult driving conditions, just rainy weather around Phoenix itself. And then as far as the flood watches go, L.A. was taken out of it, then put back in. So now we have 19 million people, and this is just for the overnight. By tomorrow morning, this will be done. This is just with that band of heavy rain. It will go through about three to four hours, and it should drop about a half inch to an inch of rain anywhere from Los Angeles to San Diego. Elevations will be a little higher, much as one to two inches of rain, and that's what they're concerned with is uh, those areas, the hillsides giving way. The great news is once we get rid of this storm, Four Corner region on Friday, it's gone. Sunny skies on Saturday throughout much of the west. Then by the time we get to Sunday, California remains dry. This will be the next storm we'll be getting to watch. And yes, that is a little chance of snow in areas of Oklahoma and in Kansas, probably a wet snow, rain in the Gulf Coast. And then this storm, Monday to Tuesday, has its eyes set on the northeast. Now this is preliminary. It's very early, but it does look like this should turn into a nor'easter. Best chance of any heavier snow, the higher elevations of northern New England. Central New England has a chance of snow too. Looks really too warm at this point for the I-95 corridor, but that's something we'll keep an eye on. And finally, Ellison, the other thing that we have to watch is after the seven-day break, it looks like after Valentine's Day, that wet weather pattern returns to California. But that's a week of recovery and dry weather until then. Bill Karens, thank you. Turning now to the latest on Capitol Hill. Senators have proposed or postponed rather a procedural vote to advance a stripped down foreign aid bill. It comes after Republicans tanked a bipartisan deal earlier today that would have increased security at the southern border, something they requested. The stripped down bill does not include those border measures, so now it's on to plan B for Democratic Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. He's pushing the chamber to vote on a smaller package, which includes just over $95 billion in foreign aid, with $60 billion for Ukraine, $14 billion for Israel, and $9 billion in assistance for civilians in Gaza, the West Bank, and other conflict zones. Speaking ahead of the vote, Schumer suggested Republicans were flip-flopping under pressure from former President Donald Trump. Republicans have said they can't pass Ukraine without border. Now they say they can't pass Ukraine with border. So today, I'm giving them a choice. They can show America where they stand and what they stand for. Which way will it be? They can either choose what's good for the country's national interest, or they can choose what's good, at least in their minds, for Donald Trump. NBC News reporter Julia Jester joins us now from Capitol Hill. So, Julia, listening to Chuck Schumer there, not long after he called a recess until tomorrow afternoon, where exactly have things been left? Allison, we have not made much progress over the course of the day or even now over the course of months. As you mentioned, the bipartisan bill that took months to negotiate linking border and foreign aid fell apart. Senator Schumer said tonight that he is letting Republicans go home and, quote, figure themselves out to come back tomorrow after a vote earlier in the day with the packages linking the two failed. And it wasn't clear that they had the votes to pass a procedural vote on the bill that strips border aid from the deal. Now, as you mentioned, Republicans asked for this, but now we face an uncertain future for the national security portion that funds Ukraine, Israel, Taiwan. And a key thing to watch out for as we head into tomorrow afternoon is will there be an amendment process that might be able to get Republicans on board, as well as some Democrats that are wary of this bill sans border measures in its current form and any amendments to the bill will have to be relevant so lawmakers can't introduce border immigration related amendments anymore because they stripped that portion from the bill and so lawmakers left here tonight tired exasperated and just as uncertain about this bill's future as we are ellison so, Julia, have Republicans, particularly leadership, responded to this allegation that they flip-flopped here and also that allegation that they did it because they're being pressured and or influenced by the former president? 
Senator Leader Mitch McConnell of the Republican minority supported this bill originally, and he voted against it, along with every other member of Republican leadership in the Senate. And this is after Speaker Mike Johnson declared the border supplemental original bill dead on arrival. Now, there have been these allegations notably from key negotiator Senator Kirsten Sinema that this is about politics, not policy. She said in a scathing floor speech earlier today that it must not be about national security for them if on Sunday the border is a crisis and Monday morning after the bill comes out, it's suddenly an election issue. Now, former President Trump has been making it clear he wants to run on this in 2024. And so Republicans are now arguing, well, the president already has the powers. President Biden could solve the border if he wanted to. This doesn't need legislation. But what undercuts that argument is that House Republicans introduced their own piece of legislation earlier this Congress, HR 2, because they recognized that a law must be passed to fix the border and immigration in any meaningful way. And so, Ellison, as we look to how this plays out politically, it's going to be a messaging game because essentially Republicans did kill this opportunity, which both Republicans and Democrats were calling it once in a, gener once in a generation opportunity to do something about the border. Ellison. Julia Jester on Capitol Hill for us. Thank you. Nikki Haley is looking ahead to Super Tuesday, campaigning today in California for the first time. It's after a pretty big loss in Nevada's Republican presidential primary last night, and she did not lose to Trump either, the Republican frontrunner. Instead, she lost to none of these candidates. That's an option to vote in that state. Now, there weren't any delegates up for grabs in the primary, but the loss is not great for her campaign. Here's senior Washington correspondent Hallie Jackson breaking down last night's race. The winner in Nevada's primary, technically no one. I'm on the fence with nobody. That's literally who won. Nobody. The option that says none of these candidates. And that's seen as a win for former President Trump, who wasn't even on the ballot. The primary last night, remember, was only symbolic for Republicans. It's the caucuses tomorrow that count toward the 26 delegates at stake in this state. And Donald Trump's all but certain to lock up those. But Trump backers, who pushed the none of the above option, hoped to deny Haley even just the bragging rights of a symbolic win. Theoretically, a symbolic win could have given her another lifeline, but losing to none of the above ends up really hurting her campaign and any momentum going forward, whether on the fundraising front or when it comes to media attention. But Haley's not concerned. She's long said she hasn't been focused on Nevada after the state party chose to also hold caucuses, seen as more favorable to Mr. Trump, with his more loyal supporters more likely to show up. We didn't spend a day or a dollar there. We weren't even worried about it. It's why we haven't talked about it. Her campaign looking ahead to the contest to come, saying in a new statement, we didn't bother to play a game rigged for Trump. We are full steam ahead in South Carolina and beyond. But before that election in South Carolina later this month comes Nevada's caucuses tomorrow, where former President Trump has campaigned and has predicted victory already, boosted by his backers pledging to show up. I voted none of the above for the primary here, and I'll be at the caucus on Thursday. Our thanks to Hallie Jackson for that. Don't go anywhere because we are just getting started. We all witnessed the horrific images coming out of Hawaii during those deadly fires. But why did so many people die in one particular neighborhood of Maui? An NBC News investigation takes a closer look. Plus, a popular game in high schools across the country left one California student with an eye injury so bad, she said she may never be able to see out of that eye again. And orcas trapped. A pod of the killer whales were stuck in drift ice off the coast of Japan. That story and others trending around the world are next, so stay tuned. Welcome back. Let's take a quick look around the world. Russia launches a new round of missile and drone attacks in Ukraine today. That attack killed at least five people and injured dozens more. They were spread out among six cities, including the capital, Kyiv. The European Union's top diplomat was actually visiting in Kyiv when the strikes happened. 
A pot of orcas trapped by sea ice has apparently managed to free themselves. They were first spotted off the coast of Japan yesterday with drone video showing them struggling to breathe through the gaps in ice. Japanese officials say they believe the orcas were able to free themselves as those gaps between the drift ice grew even larger. Prince Harry flew home to see his father, King Charles, who was diagnosed with cancer a few days ago. Harry reportedly spent only half an hour with his father at the King's home in London. Meanwhile, his brother, William, who Harry did not see during his visit, has resumed his public duties after his wife, Princess Kate, was hospitalized for abdominal surgery. And finally, a woman on holiday in Kenya found a surprise in her backpack when returning home to Ireland. That surprise? This, a Fisher's fat tail scorpion. She says it just jumped out of her wardrobe when she went to unpack two weeks after she got back home. No one was hurt by this little insect creature. Iris officials say the scorpion will live the rest of its days in comfort at the National Reptile Zoo's venomous unit. Tonight, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is rejecting the latest demands by Hamas as part of a proposed hostage release deal after four months of war. NBC News foreign correspondent Raf Sanchez has the details. Tonight, Secretary of State Antony Blinken insisting there's still a path to a deal to free Israeli hostages after Israel's Prime Minister rejected a new list of demands from Hamas. Clearly, there are um, things that Hamas sent back that are absolute non-starters. But at the same time, uh, we see in, uh, in what was sent back uh, space to continue to pursue uh, an agreement. Hamas was responding to an American-backed proposal, saying it will free all its hostages in exchange for a four-and-a-half-month ceasefire, leading to an end to the war, the release of thousands of Palestinian prisoners, and a total withdrawal of Israeli forces from Gaza. Tonight, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu calling the Hamas proposal delusional. Giving in to Hamas's bizarre demands not only won't bring the release of hostages, it will just invite another massacre, he said. In Gaza, Israeli strikes hitting the city of Rafah. Mohammed stares at his hands, shaking uncontrollably. In Han Yunus, we followed Israeli troops deep underground into what they say was a tunnel for top Hamas leaders. This is years of building. And then a disturbing discovery. The Israeli military says this was a cage where at least three Israeli hostages were held. You can see there is a slot for what they say was delivering food. And here, a lock from the outside. Somewhere in these tunnels, more hostages waiting desperately for a deal. And Secretary Blinken will meet with hostage families tomorrow. Raf Sanchez in Tel Aviv, Israel. Thank you. Today, dozens of people were killed in Pakistan after two separate election campaign offices were bombed. The uptick in violence appears to be directly linked to the country's upcoming election. Voters are set to head to the polls tomorrow to elect a new parliament. Meanwhile, the country's former leader is turning to AI to campaign from prison. NBC News foreign correspondent Josh Letterman has more. Twin explosions ripping through political offices in southwestern Pakistan one day before a landmark election, killing at least 30 people, officials say, in a country where politics and deadly violence have often gone hand in hand. So far, no claims of responsibility, but it's just the latest upheaval in a tumultuous election that's seen major arrests, rallies shut down, covert campaigning, and even artificial intelligence, all shaking Pakistan's political system to its core. One of Pakistan's most popular politicians, former Prime Minister and cricket star Imran Khan, is in prison, recently convicted of exposing state secrets and other charges. Allegations his supporters say were cooked up by Pakistan's powerful military as part of a crackdown to keep Khan and his party, the PTI, out of power. But with Khan behind bars, his PTI party is waging one of the most unconventional campaigns in modern history. Holding virtual rallies on Facebook and TikTok and relying mostly on women for in-person campaigning. The police can't easily detain women, this volunteer says. 
And get this, his party says it's now using AI voice generation to create new Khan campaign speeches posted on YouTube based on notes from lawyers who met with Khan in jail. Our people are being oppressed and their families are also being harassed, the voice says. But in a world of deep fakes and misinformation, could AI-generated campaigning open up a Pandora's box? How can voters know what's real? What we see in foreign elections in Pakistan and elsewhere is almost like a practice run of what we're going to see in our own elections in November 2024. So this is a canary in the coal mine. The parallels in American politics are already clear, like whether former President Trump could be president if he were convicted and sentenced to prison, and how he or any other candidate could hypothetically blast out AI-generated messages from behind bars, a hospital bed, or even from the grave. We need three things, education, stamping of automatically generated content that's called watermarking. And the third thing is advanced detection technology. Those solutions a ways off, putting the whole system's credibility at stake, whether voters believe what they're seeing is authentic and that elections are free and fair. Our thanks to Josh Letterman for that report. Coming up, a family is suing a California school district after their daughter was shot with a bead from a toy gun. She may never be able to see out of one eye again. We have those details, but first, you've got to see this. Frenchman Richard Plow may have broken the world's record for the tallest matchstick sculpture. Richard spent eight years piecing together close to 707,000 matchsticks to form a 23.6 foot tall model of the Eiffel Tower, easily beating the current record by a good two feet. There's just one problem though. The Guinness Book of World Record claims it may not count because Richard's matchsticks, the ones he used, they're not commercially available. Even though they have never actually seen the sculpture, that's what the Guinness Book of World Record is saying right now. But Mark McClinley, Guinness's director of Central Record Services, says they're going to review that decision because, quote, they may have been a little heavy handed with Richard's application. It's a good sculpture. Welcome back. Here are some of the other headlines we're watching tonight. Today, a federal judge rejected Donald Trump's motion for a mistrial in the E. Jean Carroll case. Just last month, the jury ordered Trump to pay her over $83 million. Trump's attorneys argued Carroll deleted threatening messages, but the judge says they failed to show how those deleted messages would have helped the former president's defense. The jury foreperson in the trial of Jennifer Crumbly said the guilty verdict was not immediately unanimous. The foreperson says that journal entries from the shooter, Ethan, asking for help that he did not receive played an enormous part in their decision. Jennifer Crumbly, who was convicted on four manslaughter counts, faces up to 15 years in prison per count. Her sentencing is set for April 9th. Today, the Supreme Court in Florida heard arguments on whether a proposed amendment that would preserve abortion rights in the state constitution can appear on the November ballot. Conservatives against it argue that it will mislead and confuse voters. Those who are in favor of it, in part, this law is funded by Planned Parenthood and the ACLU. They say it's gained enough support to make it on the ballot. Florida law says the Supreme Court can review the language before it advances. For the first time in two decades, the United States is buying more goods from Mexico than China. New data released today emphasizes how increased tensions between the U.S. and China are changing trade flows as good imports from the country dropped 20 percent. Instead, the U.S. turned to Mexico, Europe, South Korea and India for things like auto parts, shoes and toys. And the EPA is cracking down on soot, releasing new standards for particles from places like construction sites and smokestacks. A new annual exposure limit has been set to nine micrograms per cubic meter of air. That's down from 12, which is expected to save 4,500 lives by 2032. That is according to the agency. A family in California is blaming their school district after their daughter was left with a serious eye injury. They say she was hit by a water bead gun during a game played by seniors. It's known as the Assassin's Game. High school seniors use toy guns to shoot at other students, including water guns that are often filled with gel-like water beads. 
The victim, who does not want to be identified, was allegedly hit with one of those beads while she was sitting in her car in the school's parking lot. Her family says she might never regain sight in her right eye. I'm just sitting there like, oh my, like kind of like in shock. Like I'm like worried, like if it's like if my eye is bleeding, like if there's something seriously wrong with my eye, like it kind of discourages me to go to school a little bit because, you know, you go there for your education and then you come home with one less eye. NBC News correspondent Mara Barrett joins me now. She's been following this story. So Mara, why is the family and that student saying the school are at fault here, the school officials rather? Well, their daughter was on the school property in the school parking lot when this happened, and now she's facing this severe injury. Uh, we spoke with the family's lawyer who said that doctors said that they diagnosed her with blunt force trauma. Again, it's very uh, TBD whether or not she'll be able to regain vision uh, in her eye. And so the family's very upset that something that happened on school property, though it wasn't a sanctioned school event, not like, you know, school sports or anything like that. This is something that the senior class plans and the school actually warns against because of the potential dangers. Uh, but either way, the lawyer also pointed out that students were bringing these gel blasters, those toy guns, onto campus. And even though they had been confiscated many times, students continued to bring them and there was lack of discipline by the school. And so that's why the family is potentially pursuing uh, action against the school, Allison. Yeah, so the school district, while they maybe didn't sponsor this event, they were aware of it because they put out this safety alert about the quote-unquote assassin's game two weeks ago, and they listed in that the potential dangers that could come with playing, including stalking or faking a drive-by shooting. So where did this game even originate from, and how widespread is it? Well, it's, it's unknown where it originated from, but it's definitely been going on for a long time at high schools. It's kind of a senior tradition, if you will. I mean, we actually played it at my high school many, many years ago. Uh, and even then, because of safety concerns, my classmates used water guns, the actual water guns, where you would just get sprayed with water, not hit with a gel bead that could cause this type of injury. And so there is a lot of criticism around this game, especially because of the cultural era that we're in with so many of those school shootings. And so there's kind of that lack of taste around it all. But again, it's the senior tradition that often happens separate from uh, school officiated practices. Uh, but like they laid out, there's a lot of risky behavior associated with these types of games, the risks that students will sometimes go to, you know, competitive nature uh, in that sense. But again, a big question mark around the types uh, of ways you could do this because there are alternatives to play this game in a more safe manner that don't involve toy guns. So these gel water beads, they're also something that young kids typically play with. They're kind of known as like sensory game sort of thing. I've seen them because my niece has them, but I know very well that the five-year-old plays with them. The two-year-old is not allowed to because they're considered such a choking hazard. This is actually something Congress has been looking at as well, right? Yeah, these gel-based bees, water beads, uh, have faced a lot of scrutiny because of the dangers to children. The Consumer uh, Protection Safety Commission actually calls out the fact that almost 8,000 ER visits are attributed, attributed to these beads, whether it's for consumption or potential eye injuries, because these toy guns are a lot like airsoft guns, if, if you know what the pain of those feel like. Even though the bullets are squishy, they can still cause a lot of pain. And the beads work in a way that they absorb water. And so think about that. If you swallow it and then it goes into your organs, into your insides, that can cause a lot of damage uh, and, can, and doctors are worried could potentially even cause death. And so lawmakers calling for a ban, major retailers like Amazon, Target uh, have said that they will stop, they have stopped selling the beads. But the problem is, is these guns are still, the toy guns are still for sale uh, online as well. And so anything that's marketed for children, the beads have been banned from these major ret retailers, but there's obviously still some issues slipping through the cracks there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really interesting stuff. NBC's Mara Barrett, thank you. Now to a concerning trend. Hate crimes are on the rise among students, with schools becoming one of the most common places for incidents involving bias to take place. NBC News correspondent Valerie Castro has this report. Hate crimes, often acts of violence motivated by a bias like gender, race, or religion, are now reportedly happening to more and more students in schools every year. A new FBI report revealing schools, colleges, and universities are the third most common place where reported hate crimes happen, nearly doubling from 700 in 2018 to 1,336 in 2022. I'm very surprised that it is increasing 
instead of decreasing it. Students like Theodore Temple's son Teddy falling victim. The 12 year old was stabbed in the head by a classmate last year at his Colorado Middle School, according to Denver police. He just rushes at me and then he stabs me in my head. And then I started seeing like my blood, like it started coming down. I started screaming. The other student now charged with attempted murder and bias motivated crime, but has not entered a plea in court. Teddy's father says that student was once a friend until he says he began calling Teddy racist slurs. It was just totally because of his race. He had every intention of killing him. In Washington state, it was a planned attack. Natasha Wheeler says her child, who identifies as transgender, was assaulted at their high school after creating an LGBTQ club. She believes that made them a target. Prosecutors charging one student with felony assault and a hate crime for the 2022 attack. NBC News has reached out to the prosecuting attorney for the case status, but has not heard back. The world needs to see what's happening and force change, because the more people that see it, the more pressure there is to make it right. FBI statistics finding the most common bias type of reported hate crime offenses at schools was anti-black or African-American, followed by anti-Jewish and anti-LGBT. Anti-transgender hate crimes in schools increasing by 163% in the last five years, and crimes motivated by bias against disability tripling in that time. What do you think contributes to that increase? Probably the, the most important factor is social media. Social media is a huge driver of hate because haters a voice and a voice that they, they really never had. The Anti-Defamation League says it works to be proactive. We do anti-bias, anti-bullying, anti-hate work in the schools, programs which fight anti-Semitism, Holocaust education. But finds that many schools seek out help once incidents have already taken place. We certainly need to be reactive, but, but we need to be taking steps that will help us get ahead of this. Some calling on classroom lessons to extend beyond math and reading, adding chapters on tolerance and understanding. Valerie Castro, thank you. It's become a massive problem at hospitals across the country. It's called boarding. It's basically when a patient is held in the ER because there aren't any additional beds available. In tonight's NBC News reports, Ann Thompson has more on a solution that might begin at home. A new heart gave Marissa Long new life eight years ago and plenty of experience in the ER, but stays in hospital hallways for 48 and then 72 hours for rejection issues last winter were frightening. I'm immunocompromised, so I could like catch something in there and make things worse. Disturbing for the 30 year old and her dad, Michael. We go in thinking that we're moving to a room or some level of standard of care for a transplant patient in trouble. And literally we get stuck in the ER. It's not just in Los Angeles where they live. In a recent national survey, 97% of emergency room doctors reported waiting times of more than 24 hours for a hospital bed. Now a potential solution hospital at home programs. Good morning. Good morning. How are you, ma'am? I'm doing well, Manny. Like this one run by Atrium Health in North Carolina. Let me listen to your lungs here really quick. Sit up for me. Again. Excellent. Typically, 80-year-old Florence Sparks would be hospitalized for congestive heart failure, but instead she's at home. I'm getting better care here. How is it better? Well, I think they're more attentive. They're not rushed to see another patient. They're, they give you their undivided attention like Manny just did. Manny Mills, a community paramedic, visits twice a day. Sparks well, sees a doctor back. over a provided iPad once a day. I think it's going up on the LASIKs. Oh, the LASIKs, okay. Uh, going to twice a day on it. And a nurse twice. They can also provide ready-made meals. Care that's more comfortable for patients and more informative for caregivers, says Mills. You really get a 360 view of a patient's life. Absolutely. We get to see their environment. We get to see what they eat, what they drink. And that enables you to deliver better care? 1,000%. Mentally, spiritually, emotionally, um, and of course, medically. In the garage where hospital at home paramedics load up, Colleen Hole, who heads the program, says it's treating as many as 60 people a day at home. 
reducing costs up to 25 percent and resulting in fewer readmissions for some 150 diagnoses. We've got cancer, post-op surgical, women's health. Is this the future of health care? Absolutely is. We will always need hospitals. This provides, I believe, ultimately at a lower cost, a place for patients to heal in their own space. Achieving better outcomes, she says. I'm going to come see you this afternoon, okay? I look forward to it. For everyone involved. That was NBC's Ann Thompson reporting. Still to come, wildfires devastated the island of Maui back in August, but one neighborhood in particular lost many lives. Next, an NBC News investigation into what went wrong in that community. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Here are some of the stories happening out west that we're following. He calls himself the pro-life Spider-Man because he says he climbs tall buildings to raise awareness for anti-abortion causes. Today, he was arrested for climbing to the top of the sphere in Las Vegas. In a statement, he said that, quote, we care more about seeing Taylor Swift on the kiss cam than abortion. A Waymo driverless car hit a person on a bike in San Francisco. The cyclist suffered minor injuries. Police say the incident is under investigation. Yesterday's crash is the latest in a number of incidents in San Francisco involving driverless cars. And three hikers were rescued from a mountain just outside of Los Angeles, but a fourth hiker is still missing. The L.A. County Sheriff's Department says the hikers lost sight of the trail around 8,000 feet elevation on Sunday because of storms and heavy snowfall. Snowfall, rather. They hunkered down for the night, keeping warm by hovering between rocks to block the wind. They were rescued the next day. Unusual weather patterns are becoming, well, more usual these days. And one of those patterns is the atmospheric river, which you've probably heard about over and over and over again the last 24 hours or so. But do you actually know what it means? NBC News national climate reporter Chase Kane is here to break it all down. An atmospheric river can carry as much water as 25 Mississippi rivers, often referred to as a conveyor belt or moisture plume off the Pacific. ARs bring rain to the West Coast and snowpack to the mountains, which later melts, providing water during the dry summer months. That's the natural part. The unnatural part is that the more fossil fuels we burn, we're turning up the dial on the intensity of atmospheric rivers, making them bigger wetter and more hazardous. That's according to several key studies, including from NOAA and NASA. And it's because of the physics of the atmosphere when we warm the planet. For every degree of warming, the atmosphere holds 4% more water vapor, which might not sound like a lot, but it is. It doesn't sound like a lot, I agree. But in some cases, it might make actually the difference between a dike breaking or not. And it may be the difference between some part of the city suddenly being a floodplain that didn't used to be a floodplain. Our societies are built around a very narrow range of possible weather. And even when we have a relatively small change, we get outside this range of what we are used to. Scientists at Climameter calculated atmospheric rivers are bringing 15% more rain because of climate change. And that climate change is also accelerating wind speeds along California's central coast, increasing the likelihood of power outages and wind damage. Consider what's happening right now with atmospheric rivers and then add in NASA's calculations that by the end of this century, atmospheric rivers will be wider, meaning they affect an even larger area, and that they will last longer, just increasing the likelihood of dangerous flooding. In Washington, I'm national climate reporter Chase Kane. It's been six months since those deadly wildfires ravaged Maui. Tonight, NBC News has new reporting on the response and how nearly half of the fire's 100 victims all lived in one tiny neighborhood. NBC News correspondent Steve Patterson has this story. You look and, you know, you see that house on fire, that house on fire. Above the ruined remnants of Lahaina, Anthony Steele remembers those awful August flames. This was gridlock, this line on the road. <laughs> and for so many, the narrow escape. You need to go, bro. Yeah, go, go, go. The lifelong Maui resident lost three family-owned properties, his job, and the only place he's ever called home on August 8th. Steele says he's lucky he has his life. Many of his closest neighbors died that day, including his tenant and close family friend, Bernie Portabes. Do you remember the last thing he said to me? I'll drive you wherever we got to go. He, said, he just told me that he did, he's going to stay a bit longer. It's very hard. Something I got to live with. 
you know. An NBC News investigation discovered Portabes and at least 42 others who died in the Maui wildfires all lived in the same small neighborhood within Lahaina, a neighborhood of narrow streets and tight turns. You couldn't get a fire truck through my neighborhood, not on those sharp turns with everybody parking all horribly, you know. Satellite photos taken after the smoke cleared revealed a deadly bottleneck after a downed tree blocked one of the few ways out. We just can't get out. There's yeah. no way out. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay, they're working on the fire. I, all I can tell you is to get out of that area. The area, called Kahua Camp, was the remnant of once temporary housing built for workers growing sugar cane. The home's average size originally were only like 500 square feet. Crystal Smythe grew up in Kahua Camp and says as families grew, so did the homes and the neighborhood got more congested. It was already a one lane road. They started parking on the streets because the homes were adding second stories. Some were adding cottages in the back. So it became more and more dangerous that way. NBC News spoke to more than 30 people, including current and former residents of Kahua Camp, to understand why it came to account for so many of the fire's fatalities. For years, residents say they complained about access issues, cars and boats blocking the streets, some fearing they may one day face the unthinkable. We're trapped right now. We're trapped. Then they did. Yo. Maui County officials declined to comment on the neighborhood's long-running congestion and access problems, though a spokesperson for the police department confirmed a dispatcher notified officers of a downed tree in the area, but said officers were busy elsewhere and it was not addressed. What does this kind of loss do to a community like this? It's definitely wounded. You are never, ever going to be the same. I know will never be the same. I know that for a fact. He does hope it can be safer one day when he rebuilds. We just want to go home. We can't go home, though. Steve Patterson, NBC News, Maui. Before we go, it is time for the future of everything. How did posts on social media lead to nearly two dozen bomb threats? We're taking a closer look at the libs of TikTok account and what the FBI is now saying. Stay tuned. My account was, is um, very influential and effective. I mean, we've gotten about a dozen teachers fired. We're talking about bad teachers who are grooming kids. Um, we've gotten a handful of drag shows canceled. You just heard there from Haya Raychek, the founder of the quote unquote libs of TikTok social media brand. Back in December 2022, she made her first TV appearance on Tucker Carlson today after previously running her page anonymously. You might remember earlier that year, then Washington Post columnist Taylor Lorenz identified Raychek as the owner of the account publicizing her identity. She's found internet stardom among conservatives for criticizing teachers, doctors, and other professionals who are part of or support the LGBTQ plus community. Libs of TikTok post examples of what it considers far left ideology and often post the names and photographs of these professionals as well as where they work. Despite Raychek's handle, the TikTok page was shut down in 2022 for violating their community guidelines. Now, she primarily posts on X, the uh, platform formerly known as Twitter, and her account there. It currently has almost 3 million followers, despite having been suspended five different times. As Raychek mentioned, her account has resulted in people losing their jobs, like one preschool teacher in Massachusetts whose OnlyFans account was outed by Raychek. Well, now bomb threats can be added to that list, as NBC News has found that since November of 2022, 33 violent threats have occurred at institutions that were singled out by the libs of TikTok's account, 21 of them specifically being bomb threats. NBC News technology reporter David Ingram wrote this NBC News exclusive and joins us now. So, David, take us through your reporting here. What exactly did you find? Right. So you, you heard uh, Haya mention the, the schools, the teachers that she has spotlighted. And so there has been a series of these threats, mostly bomb threats against not only schools, but also hospitals, uh, small businesses that host drag shows, individual politicians and other community organizations, including libraries. 
uh, throughout 16 states um, and in Canada and the District of Columbia. And what we wanted to look at was exactly whether this pattern holds up. There had been some previous stories about a pattern where these threats are followed within days by, by these bomb threats, uh, that her posts are followed by bomb threats. And we did find that was the case in 33 examples, including 21 where there were bomb threats received. The average was that these threats came a couple days after the, the tweet from Libs of TikTok. And um, uh, they, they, this is all documented, of course, not only in local news reports, but in um, police records that we reviewed and in interviews that we conducted with the victims. So, David, have any charges been brought against specific individuals who made these threats? Is there any scenario where law enforcement is looking at the owner of these of this account, uh, Haya Raychek, and saying, OK, maybe we can hold her responsible for some of these incidents? I mean, investigating a bomb threat, it takes up a lot of police resources. It traumatizes people who are at the other end of that. What sort of consequences could there be here? That's right, Ellison. Um, everyone, every law enforcement officer I spoke to, up to the FBI, talked about how much, uh, how many resources these threats take up, even when they turn out to be hoaxes. Now, uh, it's important to note that Haya herself is not uh, a suspect in any of these bomb threats. Um, the accusation from victims and from law enforcement is that she has helped to inspire or spark these threats by essentially creating a list for someone or multiple people to go through and and pick potential targets. Um, it has frustrated law enforcement at how few charges have been brought in these cases. Of the 33 instances we looked at, only three of those instances had charges brought. The vast majority, of course, did not have charges. Some of those investigations may be open. Some of those threats were relatively recent in the past couple of months, but some of them were also um, a couple of years ago, and those cases have been closed. Uh, with no charges and and likely uh, no leads at the moment. Really interesting reporting. David Ingram with that NBC exclusive. You can read more at NBCnews.com. Thank you, David. That does it for us tonight. I'm Ellison Barber. We will see you tomorrow. But until then, stay tuned now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.